You are welcome to this brief introduction to the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 19, through chapter 13, verse 10, in our short series on Facing the End Times. We shall not try to expose or exegete all the details of this passage. Rather, we shall focus on the Christian response to persecution in the end times. Let's get into it. This section of the Apocalypse contains one of the more disturbing texts for Christians, where it reads, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, with a sword he must be slain. Here is a call for endurance and faith of the saints, that is, of Christian believers. Perhaps because of its mixture of history, theology, and symbolism, the manuscripts of the book of Revelation have suffered a number of scribble errors. For example, the 3rd century manuscript P47 and the 4th century manuscript Sinaiticus omit the relative pronoun which is before the phrase in heaven. The question is this, did copyists of these two manuscripts omit the pronoun as an oversight? Or did copyists of other manuscripts make a grammatical correction. The 5th century manuscript Alexandrinus employs a vernacular spelling of the word accuser. And in verse 12, 18, after the 5th century, many manuscripts read, I stood instead of he stood on the seashore, possibly influenced by the following I saw. And in chapter 13, verse 1, the manuscripts are divided between name in the singular and names in the plural. Then in verse 6, manuscript P47 reads, to blaspheme instead of in blasphemies. Of course, the meaning remains the same. In verse 7, several manuscripts omit the complete sentence also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, probably as an oversight, since the next sentence begins with the same first three words, meaning, and was given to it. And then in verse 10, the manuscripts differ in how they structure this verse, which is a paraphrase of Jeremiah 15.2 and 43.11, which predict retribution for disobedient Israelites when Babylonia would invade Judah. You may download this document by the link provided below. The vocabulary of this book, for the most part, is rather common and standard, but often uses the term blasphemy, which simply means speech that denigrates or defames. It could be translated reviling, denigration, disrespect, or slander. In verses 6 and 8, we have two different terms for dwelling and to dwell. In verse 6, the dwelling is skene, meaning a tent or hut, and the Greek Old Testament used for Yahweh's tabernacle, or the tent of testimony, and in other places of God's dwelling in heaven. And therefore, the verb to dwell, skenao, means to live, settle, or take up residence, but is a clear expression of continuity with God's tenting in Israel. And in verse 8, to dwell, used of unbelievers on earth, but may be purposefully used to contrast with the permanent dwelling of believers with God and of God with them. Three qualities demanded of Christians in the end time. Endurance is the capacity to hold out or to bear up in the face of difficulty. Therefore, it overlaps in meaning with patience, fortitude, steadfastness, perseverance. It can also be used of the act or state of patient waiting for someone or something, as in expectation of the return of Christ. When this calls for faith, the focus here is not belief of doctrines, 
but of a state of believing on the basis of reliability of the one trusted, and therefore means trust, confidence, faith, or loyalty in the active sense of believing in reference to Christ. And saints, of course, is a biblical term for God's holy people as an adjective pertaining to being dedicated or consecrated to the service of God. And secondly, it is used as a pure substantive or noun, that is, holy persons or things. Of special grammatical interest in this text, in Apocalypse 13.8, we read, well, let's go take a look at that. And all who dwell on earth will worship it, the beast, that is, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. 13.8 raises two special problems. First, what happened from the foundation of the world? Were names written from the foundation of the world? This is what is said in 17.8. Or was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world? The second problem is this. When do names get written in the book of life? Is it at conversion or was it at creation? And when do names get blotted from the book of life? Is it that those names had never been written? Or had they been written and then later got blotted out? A resolution of this query relates to the Greek perfect tense, which usually implies that something happened in the past and continues to the present. Thus, have been written would mean they were written and they remain so, whereas the negative, have not been written, could mean either it was never written and so is not written, or secondly, it was written but has not remained so. That is, it was written from the foundation of the world, but later got blotted out and remained so. So then, did God create some beings to be damned? Hmm. Or, or did he create everyone alive with freedom later to reject his offer of everlasting life? What is an apocalypse? The book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature that combines history, theology, and prediction by employing narrative, symbols, signs, and metonymy, most of which it draws from the Tanakh. The Tanakh is a common term used by scholars for the Old Testament, being an abbreviation of the Torah, the prophets, the Navi'im, and the writings, the Kethuvim. So, for example, the woman, Israel, will flee to the wilderness, recalling the exodus from Egypt, threatened by a flood, similar to the army of Pharaoh at the Reed Sea, the earth swallowed up, that is, what it did to Pharaoh's army, according to Exodus 15.12, the earth swallowed up Pharaoh's army, that is, they were taken down to the underworld. The sign in heaven, 12.1 reads, A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. This has remained a mystery across the centuries, whereas in recent decades, astronomers, by employing computer software simulating movement of the asters, that is, stars and planets, have demonstrated that just such a configuration occurred for 81 minutes on Tuesday, September 11th, in the year 3 BCE, the birth of Messiah Jesus in Bethlehem. Thus, this sign that John had seen with his own eyes proves true astral prophecies. Most Bible scholars recognize that the book of Revelation consists of cycles, that is, retelling different parts of the story in overlapping narratives. One such scheme of, of cycles is illustrated in this chart of six episodes, our passage being the fourth episode 
all of them being arranged around a reference to a time, times, and half times, that is, three and a half years. The narrative structure of our passage is rather simple, for nearly every sentence in this passage begins with the conjunction and, the Greek word kai. This follows a Semitic practice of employing ve or va as a new sentence marker rather than as a logic marker. Thus, the structure must be discerned from the passage's content rather than from its grammar. One simple way to outline the passage is in seven blocks. God's temple in heaven, astral prophecy fulfilled by Jesus, war in heaven when the devil was cast down, war on earth as Israel is preserved, Christians being persecuted, the eventual rise of a beast having authority over nations, and finally, Israel purified while the saints endure to the end, which we have tried to capture in this pictorial chart. If you teach or preach through this passage, we suggest that you underscore some basic historical Christian doctrines that are referenced by the passage. In 12.5, it is Jesus Christ who rules from heaven, and he will one day rule all the nations with a rod of iron. In verse 9, the spiritual enemy of God is called serpent, devil, and Satan. In verse 17, it is Christians who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony given by Jesus. And in chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, reference is to the coming world leader who will insult God for three and a half years. And in verse 10, Christians are to endure by staying faithful to Jesus. The passage brings up a number of queries. We suggest that you not spend a great deal of time trying to interpret the symbology, but rather to discuss the main points of each passage. For example, from 1119, how does this scene affect the narrative that follows? And why, is, why mention here the Ark of the Covenant? After chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, what or whom does this woman represent? Verses 3 and 4 beg the query. Verses 3 and 4 beg the question, what or whom does the dragon represent? After verses 5 and 6, you might discuss what or whom does this child represent. After verses 7 and 9, discuss when was or when will the devil be cast down to earth. After verses 10 through 12, discuss when does the kingdom of God start and Jesus' authority. Perhaps also, how do believers resist Satan's authority. Verses 13 through 16, you might note against whom has the devil not prevailed. After verse 17, against whom does the devil imagine that he will prevail? Then in the next chapter, verses 1 through 4, you might ask, from whence does the end-time government draw its authority over the whole earth? And after verses 5 through 8, what lies ahead for Christians in the end time? And lastly, verses 5 through 8, with what will Christians be threatened? And how can Christians stand till Jesus return? Thus, our assignment this week is to read through 2 Timothy 13, 1 through 14, 8, once a day this week, preferably in different translations. As we do so, we shall observe instructions on how Christians are to believe, to behave, and to endure during the coming evil three and a half years. As we do so, let us jot down other notes and queries that we want to discuss in our Bible study groups. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself make us fruitful servants as we learn to endure waiting for his soon appearance and return.